Hi, my name is Milani Douglas. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Welcome to our Fresh Talk series. We are delighted that you're able to join us for this conversation. Perhaps you're tuning in as you enjoy your meal or unwinding this Saturday afternoon. All perfect for today's conversation, exploring how identities are shaped by food exchanges like cultivation, harvest preparation, community and consumption. Um, today, it is my honor to bring together foods right activist Ann Fields Stewart and interdisciplinary artist Wanda Ramundi Ortiz, culinary artist Laura Shapiro, and interdisciplinary artist Zena Sarawiwa um, to tell us more about their work and discuss questions of global food access, gender, class, and labor. The Women Arts and Social Change Program, you go to the next slide, the Women Arts and Social Change Pro Public Programs Initiative highlights the power of women in arts as a catalyst for social change. Fresh Talk is its initiative signature program featuring cause-driven conversations with leading artists, designers, activists, social innovators, and others. This season, we are focusing on the relationship between women, art, and food as a part of the Reclamation Recipes, Remedies, and Rituals series. We would love for you to submit um, to this exhibition. Um, we're glad to have the sponsorship and support of the National Endowment for the Arts for this exhibition as well. We would also like to thank our sponsors. This initiative is made possible through leadership gifts of Denise Littleful Sobel, Denise Littleful Sobel the D Davis Dari Family Fund, Fund, the Rivada Foundation, and the Logan Family Foundation. Also, the Susan and Jim Schwartz Public Programs Fund. And additional funding is provided by the Bernstein Family Foundation and an addition support from the National Endowment for the Arts. I also would like to thank uh, my staff, Amanda Veracruz, our public programs manager, and also our, um, our partners with StreamYard with, and also 1015 Marketing Multimedia, who has brought us our website as well. Without any delay, I'm going to turn this conversation over to our presenters, and I will see you towards the end of the program. Please feel free to submit questions um, if there's anything that piques your interest, and then we will have um, that discussion at the end. Thank you, and Laura Shapiro will be our first presenter. I'm a culinary historian and I focus especially on women and cooking. And when I think about women, food and power, the topics that we're talking about today, I often uh, go right back to the 1950s, which was an era that I looked at quite closely some years ago when I was working on a book about women and cooking at that time. And what I was trying to figure out was how women really felt about the introduction of convenience foods and quick and easy products into their lives. To me, one of the most interesting of the new products was the cake mix. And stories about the cake mix really do zero right into our topic of gender and power. So I wanna just briefly tell two little cake mix stories. The first one takes place right at the beginning of the cake mix era, which is late 40s, early 50s. What happened was that after an initial surge of interest, women just backed away. They were not buying them and the food industry didn't know why. One clue, which apparently it took them a little while to figure out, was that the cakes were in fact terrible. They tended to be dry and they sometimes had a weird off flavor because the mix contained dried eggs. All you did in the kitchen was add water. Now there were also mixes on the market that didn't include the dried eggs. So in the kitchen, you added your own fresh egg. And sure enough, these had a somewhat better flavor. So maybe fresh eggs would save cake mixes. That was the thinking. So the companies did a survey. They asked women which kind of mix they preferred, the just add water mixes with the dried eggs or the add your own fresh egg mixes. The results were a little weird. Most women said, yes, the fresh egg mixes were definitely better, but they said they were more likely to buy the dried egg mixes. Price was not an issue, so nobody knew what to do with these results. So the companies basically did what they wanted. Betty Crocker used fresh eggs and Pillsbury used dried eggs. And these two companies pretty much dominated the early cake mix market. So the question is, what was going on here? What was it? that gradually did move cake mix cakes into the center of American baking. Eggs or no eggs, these early cake mix cakes were nowhere near as good as homemade 
they tasted like the additives and the chemicals that they were made of. So what put them over the top? Clearly it was not the eggs. Women had said that was not a factor in what they would buy. My conclusion after giving this much thought was that it was never the cake that made cake mixes popular. It was the frosting. The cake mix companies started to talk a whole lot about frosting. And in fact, the ads were very clear. They said, don't worry about the cake. Make any old cake mix cake, then decorate it. And here's how, here's how to use frosting to make it look like a football field or a rodeo or a princess's castle or Swan Lake. You can do anything, they said, with frosting. And of course, the real message was clear. Put in the time, put in the work. That's what will make it your cake the symbol of your creativity, and most important, the symbol of your love and care for your family. So this worked. Cakes had always been important in American domestic life, but these cakes, very easy to make, very time consuming to decorate, very festive results. They became recognized symbols of what I wanna call feminine power, not women's power, feminine power. Now, feminine power is very limited. It is entirely about stereotypes. It's the frilly blouse under the power suit jacket. It doesn't get you past the barriers of sexism and racism. It doesn't get you past the male supremacy that continues to rule the world, but it does one thing really well. When it's displayed in the kitchen, it speaks loud and clear to the people around you, the people at home. That frosted layer cake says, happy birthday, which is one of the most powerful things we can say at home. Happy anniversary, welcome home, congratulations. These are the sentiments that hold up a family. They're not laws, they're not votes, they are not a safety net, they're just sentiments. But sometimes there isn't much else besides a birthday cake to hold things together. Now, from the 1950s, I want to jump ahead to the present and tell a different story. Last year, a terrific book came out called Pressure Cooker, which was about a long-term research project carried out by a team of sociologists in North Carolina. They spent huge amounts of time with nine women, most of them low income, and they watched and they listened while these women managed the food for their families under conditions that demanded every ounce of dedication and ingenuity that they had. They were juggling part-time jobs. They had very uncertain childcare. The supermarkets were miles away. Some had no car. One of them had no stove. Several relied on food stamps and food pantries. Their lives were a far cry from those homemakers who were targeted back in the 50s by the manufacturers of cake mixes. Betty Crocker did not have in mind, for instance, Ashley's family. Ashley is the pseudonym for one of the homemakers in this book. She lives in a very crowded trailer with her husband and their two little girls and his brother and a cousin. So as I say, it's not Betty Crocker territory, but in one very memorable scene in the book, Ashley and the two little girls are using a Betty Crocker rainbow chip cake mix. They're baking for their cousin. They're making a batch of welcome home cupcakes for him because he's just gotten out of jail. Ashley's using an old plastic ice cream tub to mix the batter because she doesn't have a large bowl and the girls are using a little fork to help mix because they don't have big spoons. The cupcakes come out fine. You have to hand it to cake mixes. They always work. And the little girls slather them with frosting and decorate them with sprinkles. Welcome home, they are saying loud and clear. We love you. As it happens, the cousin is not interested in cupcakes. He goes outside to have a beer with a friend. It doesn't matter. Ashley and her daughters will keep going. They know how to do this. They will strengthen the circle of caring that is this family's and any family's most valuable possession. Much, maybe most of America does not wanna be bothered with this family. They don't wanna put even a penny of their taxes into a safety net for this family. Ashley has her work cut out for her, so do the rest of us. But she is doing every single thing she can. She is mixing cake batter in an old ice cream tub. 
That is determination as hard as steel. That is love and that is power. Hi, uh, my name is Wanda Rimundi Ortiz and I am a, um, an associate professor at the University of Central Florida. I teach uh, studio art um, and my concentration is in uh, performance, mixed media, interdisciplinary work. Um, so, so an illustrator walks into a bar. Um, so I was initially trained um, as an illustrator. I went to FIT in New York, the Fashion Institute of Technology. And I am, I'm presenting this first slide just to show kind of where my work started. And I was making superhero characters um, based out of this sort of, kind of based out of, out of myself. Can we go to the slide? So you see these images, uh, they're part of the Wepa Woman a series. Uh, Wepa Woman is this character that I developed um, who shared my ideologies about kind of preserving Puerto Rican uh, values and, 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 you know, kind of combating, combating uh, invisibility, but also she also struggled with kind of urban in, you know, hood type, you know, stereotypes. And she wanted to combat that, but the character, the character, the Wepa woman character sounded like me, but did not look like me. The other character looked like me, but didn't sound like me. In this illustration, here's a sample of um, one of my illustrations for a friend of mine, Vanessa Hittery, uh, whose moniker is the Hebrew Mamita. The book is called The Last Kaiser Roll in the Bodega. And she hired me to do this work because I have this sort of urban flair. And why I did not pursue illustration um, as a profession was that I was uh, discouraged to make such ethnic uh, figures and and features, and so that for me was just a I couldn't I couldn't roll with that. Next slide. So um, one of the many jobs that I had while I was sustaining myself was uh, while you know before I became a professor uh, was I was a karaoke hostess in uh, New York City. And so this is one of the illustrations, samples of my drawings, and then I converted to illustrations and I, I made my own flyers to promote my exhibitions. Next slide. So you'll see there's, a, you know, I employed a lot of uh, comic book aesthetics and uh, mural making work um, in my in my studio practice. Uh, this, is, this is how I um, how I reconciled you know, wanting to do illustrations, but wanting to be in the in the art world because I didn't really want to be told what to do or how to make my my marks. But I was also encouraged to make uh, to be, get in front of the camera to tell my stories more directly. Um, and so, while I'm trained as an illustrator, I be I started dabbling with interdisciplinary work, doing you know work in video, because the shortest distance between point A and point B is a straight line. And so I started I started moving into performance work. Next slide which brings us to the Ask Chuleta series, um, where I interrogate the contemporary art world in the moniker in the guise of this kind of urban inner city um, woman. More than, more than likely, no one would consider this woman to be, uh, to be an authority on art, but this, was, this person is me. And again, it's sort of addressing this idea of, of invisibility uh, in the art world. I don't know if that link is gonna work, but in the interest of time, we can proceed. With this then led me to Las Reinas, the Queens. Um, the, much of the work that I was making while I was in New York City, like I said, born and raised in New York City um, as a Puerto Rican woman, much of the work that I was making was very much informed by the city, by the stimulus of the city. And then I ended up getting a job at the university. I had to leave New York um, <clears throat> and, and take up residence in Orlando. And one of the things, two things that the job uh, provided me was, uh, St financial stability after many, many years of hustling a million different jobs and um, and quiet in order to think. And I, I was at that point when I realized that all of my work was were responses to the immediate stimulus of being in the city. And now I had to add quiet. And so now I could actually hear my own thoughts and kind of reconcile with my, reconcile and deal with my anxieties. Next slide. So you can see I started uh, 
I decided that I wanted to create uh, these sort of fem these 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 uh, female archetypes, these royal archetypes dealing with um, different traumas that I was working with, and I feel I felt like I could start to examine um, my trauma by much like a storyteller, much like a like a, a comic writer, developing these characters and creating these realms where these where these uh, these kind of urban futurist characters could live. And so the image on the left is a Gringa Reina where I'm examining Eurocentric uh, beauty standards. And um, I became very fascinated with the Kardashians popularizing um, body contouring and body modification. And so I wanted to examine what it, what it would take to make me look like a more desirable Eurocentric woman. And on the right is the bargain basement sovereign, um, this woman who sits on a throne with uh, attendants, ladies in waiting. I'm about six feet tall from head to toe in this outfit. And, I, and the only way to hold, hold court with me is to leave trash on me. This is an examination of like submission and resilience and poise. Um, and also kind of the, the sexualization of the, theme of, the, of the Latina body. Next slide. This slide is the Guerrillerina, the sort of warrior queen, which is an examination of surviving domestic uh, and kind of partner uh, violence and partner abuse. Um, and after having, you know, uh, completed therapy, um, the kind of hypervigilance to make sure that, that kind of thing didn't happen again turned into um, a double-edged sword for me as a person. And I found myself being overly protective in way too many circumstances. And this kind of psycho uh, this psycho the psych these images become like a psychological landscape or a psychological uh, portrait of me. And so through mixing materials in all of the queens, um, I offer uh, viewers an opportunity to kind of investigate what, why the bubble wrap, why this, why plastic, um, why barbarian armor, et cetera. Next slide. In this uh, next slide where, and this is actually a still from a video, which I'd like to share. This is about, uh, this, is, this video is um, created as an homage. Well, I don't wanna say an homage and that's not right. This is a this is an opportunity to examine um, parental grief and communal grief um, because of bias violence against black and brown bodies. So as you can see in the video, this is uh, this piece was commissioned by the National, the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington D.C. in 2017. Um, in this piece, I am I invite uh, 33 uh, people of color to come and sit with me for three minutes and 33 seconds, um, and this is inspired by uh, the iconic Michelangelo uh, Pietà sculpture where Mary holds. Uh, the corpse of her deposed uh, of her son deposed from the cross, and this was a deep uh, meditation on communal communal grief, um, experiencing uh, experiencing the, the murder of Trayvon Martin and so many others who have fallen to bias crimes, and thinking also about the people that are left behind, um, thinking about how the family and friends of those people that have that were that have been harmed also have to watch uh, character assassinations of those people that have that have perished um, in the news. And we've seen this in the Bri Breonna Taylor case. Uh, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing blanks now. I'm sorry, so sorry. Um, but y'all understand, this is a kind of a, the fact that there's so many names to, to think of, Sandra Bland, uh, Philando Castillo, and many, many others shows that this is just you see how this is playing out publicly. And what my invitation is to have people come and sit with me and let me hold them for three minutes and kind of just be safe with people that care and love you for three minutes. But then time is up.
right? And so we witness this, this, we don't have an opportunity to kind of grieve and not be told to like get over it and racism is dead and it's all in your head, et cetera, et cetera. And as a mother to a brown child, I also was thinking very much how Mary knew uh, the fate of her son and could not stop it. And I think about um, the fear that we parents have for our children going out in the world, the inevitability of something happening, some kind of injustice occurring. Next slide. This next image is, um, this is an homage to the people who perished in Puerto Rico, the people that survived in Puerto Rico that were able to, um, that were able to uh, flee the, the, the insanity that was Hurricane Maria and everything that came with it. Um, and also those that were left behind because of lack of resources to be able to stay, to that they had to stay there. Um, and because I live in Orlando, there was a lot of people, so many people um, uh, relocated for back of a, lack of a better word, to Orlando seeking uh, seeking opportunity and a, a, and a place to start over if they had lost everything on the island. Uh, we know that people lived up, some, some people up to nine months without uh, electricity and running water. And so um, I wanted to create a procession down from a uh, one mile procession from one arts institution, the City Arts uh, fact, the City Arts Gallery in Orlando to the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center in downtown Orlando to draw attention to the idea of migration to the people who were living on the island or uh, living in, in Orlando um, but the stories were not being told about people kind of not uh, getting, uh, kind of always living in kind of this limbo state with the FEMA hotels and, um, and not being able to communicate with people back on the island. And so a year after the hurricane, 18 months after, I actually, I was able to go to Puerto Rico with my custom designer and we recovered about maybe somewhere upwards of 50 pounds of debris still uh, found, that you can still find out in the streets. And, and so this garment, which is an Afro-Puerto Rican folkloric uh, inspired garment is made entirely out of debris that we found. Um, and it weighs about 45 pounds. And then this culminated in a very joyous event um, of Afro-Puerto Rican um, uh, dance and song. Um, Cause I wanted to, I wanted people to see and feel the weight of this kind of situation, but also recognize the kind of resilience that it takes to survive and endure spirit and, and you know, that, that, that pride amid such emotional and psychological violence and chaos. Um, and I think next slide. So I have, after these, after this work, I decided to return back to my illustration roots and I wanted to continue to draw these to ethnic, as I was told in the past, is just draw attention to beautiful um, women of color and hair wraps. And I'm incredibly concerned with the, the, the it's less now, but uh, the steady mitigation of blackness or how what's, what's too black or whatever that, whatever craziness that's supposed to mean um, and the hair politics that that engages. Next slide. These are images of myself and my child. The one on the left is a mother and child and uh, just kind of going back to going back to my illustration and drawing roots. Next slide. Um, my steady interest in hair and hair politics stems from my own issues as a light-skinned Puerto Rican woman with very, very curly hair, being told that I need to straighten my hair, that it's, you know, that no one, you know, I'm too pretty to have my hair like that, whatever that means. Um, although we all know what that means. Um, and I become increasingly interested in only drawing hair. Um, and drawing these uh, variety of textures. And so I've also started making objects in order to examine these things further. The last thing I'll say on this is that in, in this entire climate of COVID, um, of civil, uh, civil unrest, I decided to start gardening um, and I failed miserably and at gardening and uh, thinking that I would you know, uh, provide my own food justice for my family, but I did not know that nature was gonna win um, and beat me down pretty bad in terms of uh, disease and bugs and critters and thingamabobs. And what ended up happening is that I started to I started to get very inspired by the strange forms that were occurring, either from bugs or, or things rotting. Um, and this became a metaphor for me um, about how nature is going to do what nature is going to do 
and um, and how nature will not be contained. Next slide. And so I started making these objects with the hair that you see that was present in all of my earlier works with high-end materials like uh, gold leaf against low low-end materials like chicken wire and spray foam and these used extensions that people uh, generously donated. Um, and I started to create these strange structures made with the same material that I made my original wigs. But at this point, the wigs seem to be mutating. And while I do not feel safe or comfortable in any way, shape, or form doing public performance right now, especially social justice work, because I, you know, I do not feel safe. Um, it's a very volatile time. I feel that in that same vein, the wigs have begun to mutate and that they are ready to move on without me. Next slide. So these are some, these are, this is another view of a different one of my sculptures and the drawings that I make um, are, uh, are from these structures. Next slide. So this is the way to find me. Um, I'm at U the University of Central Florida. Here's my Instagram, my, my, my email. My Instagram is Wanda underscore Raymundi. Um, you can subscribe to my YouTube page. You can certainly view my webpage of www.raymundiart.com. You can join my mailing list. These are some more of the videos you can see. Um, next slide. Gracias. Hi there. Uh, my name is Ian Field Stewart. I use they, them, she, her pronouns, and I am a black, queer, non binary, trans feminine, lesbian storyteller working at the intersection of theater and activism. And I'm here today because I am also the founder of the Oprah Project. So I don't have any slides today. Um, I'm just going to kind of tell you uh, our story and how all this came to be and sort of what um, thinking about place and power and um, where I feel like I fall in that. So uh, our journey began in December of 2018. So I take a great big sigh because it's uh, it's a long story and it's um, a good one. And also uh, thank you so much to uh, the National Museum of Women in the Arts and all of these incredible speakers who I get to speak amongst uh, for your beautiful words and for um, including me in this evening, by the way. I meant to say that at the beginning. Um, so in December of 2018, um, I had been thinking for a while about the fact that I was going to be going home for the holidays and I was going to be with my family of origin and that they, they would still love me and respect me for all of who I was. And I remembered that for many of my you know, siblings, this was not the case, that um, many of them couldn't go home. Many of them had to uh, rely on chosen family rather than family of origin, which is, you know, totally fine. Um, but it can also feel feel sad, particularly around the holiday season. And so I wanted to create something that felt like a way to alleviate loneliness. And so I always sort of find it funny when um, when people define me as a food activist. Um, and I recognize that, that is part of what I do. But for me, so much of it is about um, alleviating loneliness and making people feel a little less alone in the world. Um, so the idea that I had was to hire Black trans chefs to go into the homes of Black trans people and cook healthy, home-cooked, and culturally specific meals for them. And, you know, we oh, we started this thing on a Wednesday, or we launched it on a Wednesday, thinking, you know, we'll raise $500, and then three days later, we raised $6,000, um, and realized, you know, oh, okay, this is going to be much bigger than we thought. And so uh, we made the commitment then and there that we were going to keep this thing running until the wheels fell off, and the wheels are firmly in place, I'm pleased to say. Um, so... People kind of like to ask me often about like, you know, the story of uh, how we came to be and also what, um, why food and why um, we chose this idea of specifying that it's a black trans chef that's going into the homes of black trans people. And I think for me, um, what I always go back to is the fact that some of the most transformative conversations I've had with family members, with friends, with anyone have always been around food. Um, we go to dinner to have difficult conversations. We have, we go to dinner um, to begin love. We go to dinner to end love. We go to breakfast and brunch to gossip and chat with friends. Um, food in many ways is, um, is the place. Uh, and I think that thinking of our kitchens, thinking of our, um, 
as a place of gathering rather than as, you know, just a, sort of a place of production, but as a place of gathering, a place of community. Um, and the power, you know, doing the little theme, uh, the power that can come from, from uh, when we find ourselves in place and where we find ourselves in a space of gathering and community. And so that's a lot of what uh, we try to do with the Okra Project. Now, obviously, this has um, this has been made complicated by the pandemic. And so when when the pandemic first struck, we created uh, bags of groceries that people would come to my home and pick them up. We also had a large food donation that filled my living room. And we found a volunteer, packed up the back of a car and went door to door, sort of like a traveling grocery store. And then as the pandemic went on, we realized that this wouldn't be, you know, totally effective. And so we decided instead to, um, to create our COVID-19 relief fund. And that would be how we would kind of support people in this time is that, that we can't cook the food for you, but we can at least pay for it. And so that was kind of, that was sort of put the pause on things for a long time as we continued to, you know, Give, um, give money and things like that. And then in May, of uh, May 31st, I had been also thinking about for a while how, you know, this we've had this cultural shift to focus on mental health and self-care, but specifically thinking of therapy. Yet we've done nothing to really address the fact that therapy is often very expensive and very inaccessible for the people who need it the most. And so I was just thinking, you know, we need to make therapy free. This needs to be something that is provided for free. So I realized that that was something that I had the power to do something about. So on May 31st, we released the Nina Pop and Tony McDade Mental Health Recovery Fund. And you know, our original commitment was, you know, we were gonna commit $15,000. We asked the community to meet, meet that, uh, to match that. And uh, very quickly, uh, we were raising about $100,000 a day. So again, we sort of went well over what we were expecting. And this transformed us from a collective, you know, of, you know, $6,000 in a dream to being a fully fledged organization. So um, in the past, uh, since June, uh, we have uh, distributed um, over a quarter million dollars in COVID-19 relief. We have um, provided 125 free therapy sessions with Black therapists for Black trans people. And we have also, through a corporate partnership with Uber Eats, um, given out over 1,500 vouchers for up to 20, $25 off food orders made through Uber Eats. Um, and so we've been really proud of the work that we've been able to do. Um, I think that if, as we're you know, thinking about what it means uh, to be given power, to have be given place, uh, there's a definitive responsibility that I feel we have as leaders in community, as people who step forward to try to make a difference. Um, there's a responsibility that we have to um, making sure that as we grow, we still feel close to community, that it still feels heart forward. And I have absolutely failed at that many times and I'm still learning and still growing. And I am so grateful for the people who continue to support our work through, you know, through the failures and the successes, because I think that our stories um, must be multi multifaceted. And at a time where we are in the middle of a pandemic, at the time where um, our sisters and brothers and siblings who look like us um, are being murdered, I think that we have to we have to hold close to each other. And so I continue to be grateful for those who um, are able to hold close to me and also grateful for those who hold me to account um, as we go through this period of growth. Um, so that is my story. And you know, thank you again to National Museum of Women and the Arts for uh, including me in this moment. I'm very grateful. And uh, thank you to all these fabulous speakers. I've been really enjoying hearing about um, all of your different artistry. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, my name is Zina Sarawiwa. Um, I'm an artist. Um, I, what kind of artist am I? Um, we're going to go through some slides, not just yet. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do. And then what I want to do is just have like a run of some slides, just one after the other. Um, I think it's kind of a bit more effective that way. 
So um, first of all, thank you to the National Museum of Women in the Arts for inviting me to this and to talk about food and my practice and the idea of place and power. Um, place is a very important issue, a, a, a thing, an issue that I meditate on a lot in my practice and in myself. Um, you know, I'm from three different places in many ways. I was born in Nigeria, brought up in the UK, but the last sort of 10, 11 years of my life have been in America and I've become an artist here. Here is where, you know, New York gave me permission, told me I was an artist, gave me permission to be one or allowed me to give myself permission to be an artist. And so much of art is about permission, ultimately. Um, anyway, so America has been amazing for that to me. So, but you know, so thinking about place is, you know, very important because also I'm from a place that um, has dealt some really sort of powerful wounds in my family and, um, and in my consciousness. And so, you know, I'm from an oil producing region of Nigeria called the Niger Delta, one of the most polluted places in the world. Um, but it's a place that, and my father was an environmental activist and I feel like I talk about him a lot, but it's also, it's inescapable in many ways. And he was killed this month, 25 years ago with eight other people by the military government at the time for their protests against Shell Oil for despoiling our land and underdeserving our people essentially, who are, you know, farmers and fishermen mostly, I would say in a Goni land, which is the specific um, ethnic group that I belong to. So, um, so yeah, so it was, you know, a very difficult sort of moment in our family and for our people more widely. And it's a, you know, a situation that sort of continues to this day. And, um, but for me, my identity was, you know, I'm someone who, you know, grew up in the UK from the age of one years old, but, and always taught to be proud of Nigeria. Then this thing happened. And then our identity was sort of taken over by this sort of death, this gruesome death. And um, about, you know, the, our place, our, place of birth, which was became a magnet for a lot of attention about environmental despoilment and environmentalism generally. But, um, and I, I kind of stayed away from it for a long time and um, found my way back in about, you know, 10, 15 years later, in a sense, to really start to access what was going on. So about, I became an artist in 2010 is when I described myself as an artist. And it was in 2013, I decided to go back to the Niger Delta and um, and sort of get to grips with this place that I was from. You know, I have a very hyper-specific sense of my identity. I don't really, you know, I don't easily identify as black, for example, depending on where I am in the world, to be honest with you. If I'm in Brazil, I do. I identify as black in Brazil, but in other places, I like to be much more specific. But where I'm from, I'm very much a Goni, you know, which is my ethnic group, my tribe in Nigeria. I, I don't have a problem with the word tribe. I'm from a tribe called the Goni people in Nigeria, and that's where I'm from. Um, I'm also Nigerian, um, I am British, um, I'm Brooklyn, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm never going to be a Californian, but I live here now. So place has always been this issue and finding a sense of home is, I've never resolved it, but all I knew is that I had to go back to this place where I was born and which um, had dealt this like wound in my family that just keeps expanding and going and going and going in many ways. How do I deal with this place? And so you go there and mostly people that travel there want to talk about the problems and want to talk about the issues. But for me, it's like I live in a place of trauma. I'm not going to like amplify that by talking more about it. I have to find healing. So um, I sort of go there and I went there in a spirit of wanting the land to speak to me and not imposing a story or trying to look for a particular um, set of um, you know, evidences of the trauma that, you know, you want to, you know, tell the whole world about in a sense. And my thing was like, yes, it's important people know about these problems, but also you grow traumas that you focus on in a particular way. So for me, it's really about healing and also entering into that space in a more sort of, with a more feminine um, modality. And when I say that, I feel that, or female rather modality. And when I say that anyone of any gender can enter into that place with that mentality, I would say, I, I for me, it was really about letting the land speak to me as opposed to going to the land and imposing myself on it and saying, well, this is what these are the stories I'm going to tell. You can't, you can't do that. You have to wait. And, you know, I think being an art, not all artists are like this, but for me, being an artist means allowing the thing to tell you what it is. I, I think of places and hmm, things as all beings. Everything's like a being to me in a sense. Uh, I think of ideas as beings. I think of 
places as beings, my artworks as beings. And I, I like to wait for the thing to reach me. People just call it inspiration. I think of it as inspiration, but something a bit more than that. And so when I entered the space and, you know, I see like beauty, I see resilience, I see fecundity because it is such a fertile region. And yes, it's this fall, but also at the same time, it's still fertile. And there is, there's so much beauty that's there that you never see or it's never talked about. And so I had to like enter into that space and just to start to think about, okay, I want to focus on this and I want to show what we can be. Because in a way, when we're always talking about how depressed and how awful things are, you don't get a sense of what we can be. You know, you actually take on the identity of this oppression and not actually, and it's actually harder to get out of it. So it feels very counterintuitive to go into a space and try to like seek the joy. But in a way, I had no choice in the matter because for my own psychic survival that's where i had to go to find you know i'm defined by death completely but so for me it was i had to find life and this is where you know food comes into us because it ended up being food as the way it has, you know food has kind of unveiled its way into my practice and i'd always tack it on as like oh yeah and i work with food as well but food knew better and food was telling me that no food is actually the the heart and the center and this is why and it's still telling me why it's in the process of telling me why so one of the first works that I did, I sort of arrived there in 2013 and I set up a gallery and I started making these works. I can't even tell you where the ideas came from. They just sort of like dropped into the top of my head. And I always say the top of your head is a very interesting place. Um, it's not nothing and it's not random. So um, these ideas sort of came to me. And um, one of the ideas I wanted to do was something called the Mangrove Banquet. So I've always been interested in food, always loved food, but you know, been obsessed with it, cooking especially. I just loved cooking and I cook a lot. Um, always watch TV shows about food, I still do. Um, read a lot about food, really should be doing food studies at this point because that's the thing I care about the most. But for me, it's become a very interesting lens through which to understand a place. And, um, and for me, it was a thing that, demonstrated life in a place that seems to be all about death in some ways. And so I wanted to do this thing called the Mangrove Banquet in order to sort of really get people excited about the region and just to think about, um, I think the agricultural side, because we were known for being the place that, you know, we were like the bread basket of the, of the whole region. We have incredible soil there and our water table is pretty high as well. So it's, it was always very um, easy place to farm and, you know, it's, the biodiversity is incredible. So it's this really, it's actually a very beautiful place and it's just like the worst place to find oil, especially from people who don't care about, you know, the people that live there and don't care about, you know, um, clean air and don't care about the trees and don't care about animals. You know, if you do it in a desert, maybe, you know, it's, you can get away with bad practice, which you shouldn't, but you probably could. But to do it in a place like that, it's just, it's just everything bad came together in the same place. It was just a really a terrible situation. So I want to tap in and, re, you know, put the idea of the, of the joy and the fecundity and the, and the way it inspired me into the mangrove banquet. So what I did is that I, um, it was at Blaffer Museum who had given me a solo show for, um, for my work. And I was going to do all the work that, show works I'd made in the Niger Delta. And to their credit, they had no idea what I was going to do. And I had no idea. I couldn't tell them. But, you know, as I went along, the works um, presented themselves to me. And the Mangrove Banquet was um, one of the, I wouldn't say it was one of the came at once. But I really wanted to, I've always done sort of feasts and food and, um, and I wanted to do a sort of banquet that's specific to the Niger Delta that was about the bounty of the Niger Delta, but also attended to and talked about the labor that's involved there. So um, I did these dishes that were reimagined. I never ever do anything kind of straight or traditional. So we did like a raw fish, I did a raw fish dish with um, an aioli with scent leaf, I think it was. Um, I did a more traditional main course, like um, some grilled fishes and and plantain, which is bole and fish, which is what we have in Potakot in Nigeria. And I encouraged people to eat with their hands and dessert was something like, I think it was a alligator pepper ice cream with some crushed chin chin and a kind of guava compote. So, and I also did this, um, I've been working with gin since 2014 and I have some major gin projects that, you know, gonna launch soon, I think, maybe next year, but something I've been working on since then. And I, you know, got some of our local, palm wine gins and um, 
uh, palm wine gins and did these cocktails. And yeah, it was a really kind of wonderful event, golden pineapples everywhere. And, um, and it was about the kind of life and the fecundity and I want people to be happy. And, and it was a very joyful moment. And I had music, um, sensual music, I can't, sensual music from black women. It was like Patrice Russian and all the women are like, so it was a joyful thing. So yeah, you can, let's just scroll through them. It's like 20 images, bang, bang, bang. Oh, and these like napkins were made by a woman in the Niger Delta who teaches um, printmaking and, you know, carving the blocks yourself as a woman, which women do often don't do. Yeah, this is the Crudo. God, it looks good. Carrot ribbons. Goodness me. And then there's, <laughs> oh, stop, stop, stop for a second. That is, um, is alum falama bitters. It's like a bitters, and I made it into a granita. So that was actually something that we started with. I thought, I thought that was a pretty great idea. That was fun. Sorry, keep going. Golden pineapples. Oh, that's the dessert. That's the alligator pepper ice cream. Um, yeah, this is the, I wanted it to feel like a wedding. And we had the assistance of some this amazing chef um, and um, and his crew. And that was, it was just such an extraordinary pleasure to have them make this happen. So it was a case of me having to go into their kitchen. So, okay, this is how we make this food, which is funny because I'm not a chef and I'm teaching these like actual chefs how to make this food. But, um, but they were amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, these are people that were invited. I think it was a first come, first serve kind of, um, it wasn't a paid event, it was free. So that's our roasted fish. God, I'm hungry. Um, that was a nice man who helped us, the granita again. Um, we can whip through quickly. Dessert, bum to bum to bum Now, one of the important things of this is that, you know, this is our, the, this is a mixologist. I can we stop that? That's perfect. So um, I think the next time I do one of these things, I'll be doing the cocktails myself because I've, I've actually developed quite a, big, a, a range of cocktails because I do them in Nigeria at my gallery. Every time we have a show, I do different um, gin cocktails, palm wine gin cocktails. Um, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so the thing about the mangrove banquet is that we have a, there were no images of it. I forgot to put them in. But what we have is a performance going, taking place. It's silent. That's happening throughout the whole thing where we have a woman, a black woman, an African woman with um, the kind of clay on her face and, and a mask on her face as well. So it's clay on her body and her face, but then a mask on top of the face. And she's just got a wrapper around her. I think the next time I do it, she'll be topless. Uh, just the wrapper around the waist, which is how a lot of the older women kind of spend their time at home just just and that's just quite normal and you know dragging around the a pestle and mortar and pounding and pounding and pounding and then getting the the, the, the we have the kind of um uh the brooms that we have that we don't have the sticks at the end so you're bending over again you're sweeping and you're sweeping and it was really important to me to have this spectral figure moving in silence around the sort of like the, the joyful um, consumption. Because for me, it's, and it was a little a sort of unsettling presence. And it was important to me to have that because it also sort of really sort of demonstrates what happens in the Niger Delta. You know, you know so much is, it is, is enjoyed off the backs of, of people that are, are suffering over there. And also I, I like to think about the farming women, you know, in Nigeria, where, in the, the, the Goni land is no different. And a lot of Africa, you would see that um, the farming women are, are the average age is over 60. And so I always see these women that I just find so beautiful. They're just, they're older, they're just, they have the, they're not doing anything kind of fancy with their hair and nothing crazy like that. They just like these beautiful, they're just amazing and they're working in the farms and they're carrying heavy loads on their heads at this age and I just find them um, magical. I find them, and I'm doing a lot of work, I mean, my new feature film actually is, it's about a lot of things, but actually it's this figure of this African farming woman that's so important to me that, you know, I'm sort of, I feel like, I'm not elevating anyone, they already are elevated, I just want to, you know, shower my praises upon these women who are forgotten and people always think of them as people that need help and don't know anything about the land and they're just like waiting for you know someone to give them some seeds and or to help them with their farming and I'm just like fuck you you know that's how I feel about it fuck you don't these people you know you don't honor their knowledge you don't honor anything about them. You just think of them as people that you just forget about or they're people that don't know anything and they know so much. They they have humility, they're quiet and they have like so much more knowledge in them that, you know, than, 
you'd have to do the work to extract it from them. And they just don't tell you about it. They're just taking help where they can, they're keeping it moving. And I actually wrote something in a book in one of my monographs. Um, and I'm not gonna apologize for swearing because that's how angry I am about it. I'm not gonna apologize for that. Um, I feel like um, I wrote this, I, this story of a woman that um, I was talking about why I wanted to do all this food with work. And I, was, I felt like I was channeling the spirit of some farming woman. And in a way she didn't care what I was doing. The way I wrote about it was that, you know, she didn't care about what I was doing. She just could have carried on doing her labor, her work. And that's the energy of these women. They just sort of keep going and they just keep going. And here I am, this like artist from the West going, wah, 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 just like, you know, pissing about, but doing what I need to do. And they just look at you and they respect you. And then they just keep doing what they need to do. And I, just, I love that energy. I love them. So I think a lot of my work is about honoring those. And these are like, like my grandmothers, you know, for example. You know, these are women that do that and they're traders as well. You know, so there's this like, this is honorable part of, you know, African life that I, I'm trying to honor and attend to in this work, whether they care that I'm honoring them or not. And I don't think they care, but I care. So um, I think I might have, I mean, I shouldn't supposed to talk about table manners now, but I'll talk about it very, very quickly because I think I've talked for too long. But um, table manners is another piece that came to me whilst I was out there. And it came to me in the most beautiful way in that it was a very light way of uh, entering. It's sort of like, t I felt the touch at the top of my head and thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny if? And it was just like, what a simple, stupid idea actually, just filming people eating. Why is that interesting? Why would you do it? But I, for me, I did it for myself. I just, I always described it as a personal passion project because I don't, for some reason, I really get off watching people eat and it produces a chaos within me. It's not like it turns me on. It's just this thing of like, it makes me feel all sorts of things, mainly pity, actually. It's a weird thing. Don't ask me why. It's not discussed, well, it can be discussed, but it can, it's a lot of pity. There's a lot of um, love. There's, there's all these things wrapped up in eating for me that I don't, I don't understand it. But, you know, and I always say this, that I, I make work about things I don't understand. So this is me trying to understand what it is. And I still don't understand it. I made this work, I started making this work in 2014. I made the last batch in 2019. I still don't understand why I like it so much. And I normally don't watch my work, but this work, I love to watch it. And I'm just like in hysterics the entire time. Anyway, so Table Manners is people eating for the camera. And I've done different, um, it's mostly Agonies in Agony Land, but it's not exclusively that. Um, I have one that I'm doing actually in America, which actually features white men, but that's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> and uh but this one is people eating with their hands and um just engaging with you directly it's not a performance a lot of my work is about exploring the relationship between um you know who you are as yourself and how you who you are as a performer and the relationship between reality and performance there's a kind of interesting space but in between that so that's what interests me. And so these are my eaters. Um, I've done two seasons. I also did one about a man eating a tortoise. Can we go back to the blue slide? Because I think that was a Miami Basel. And then I just wanted to show the, the triptych one. Sorry, maybe it's, maybe you didn't put it in there. I don't know. The Basel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there we go. So here on the right of the image is like a, a, a sort of like a video sculpture, which is a man eating, actually eating a tortoise. But this, that one's about folk tales. So, you know, my work, people are eating in the film. It's, it's, and people think that, oh, it's about table manners and it's about colonialism. It's like, actually, it's not really about any of these things. I'm not trying to subvert or fight. The whole energy of it is, is about just being. I don't have to prove, none of these people have to prove anything to anyone. And it's not about doing that. It's just about inhabiting your being and inhabiting yourself just quietly. And you don't have to stick your fist, your, your, your a fist in the air. You don't have to do any of those things. You just need to eat your food, plant yourself. And that's the energy that I think, that's the vortex and hopefully the energy that I'm putting out there with these works. And they're not easy to watch. People tell me all the time that they're not easy to watch. But, um, but they have their own power and they're doing their, like my baby's doing their own, making their way in the world. And right now they're showing at um, Times Square um, as part of the Midnight Moment series started by Times Square Arts. And so um, I'm enormously proud to have Ogoni people 
eating with their hands, eating our food, and you hear the names of the food at the beginning, and you hear you read the names of the places at the end of the of the of the work. So I'm trying to get people to ingest the Niger Delta, ingest it. And I also realize that it's important that, you know, now I live in LA, but I'm still working in Nigeria too. It's this thing of like, how do I bring worlds together? I used to feel guilty. Like, why is my work always about this place that I'm having to fly to constantly, or I live there. It's just like my life is always in multiple different places. Right now it's all about integration, integration and, you know, find and meeting the moment and just, Integration is such an important word for me right now. So I'm trying to find ways in which, you know, people ingest the nice Delta, just as the world ingests American culture, ingests British culture and all the other cultures. And I'm grateful for all of it. I like all of it. It's all really interesting. Now, have some of mine. That's it. I was like blowing up the chat, like, oh my god! <laughs> you are all, you are all such amazing and powerful Ooh. women. I'm so, I'm so grateful to hear all your oh stories. God, it's such cool stuff. It's um, yeah. I'm, organizations like I don't know how you do that. I've failed singularly to like do anything with my foundation. <laughs> Just <hearing laughs> you say, like, how Thank do you, you do that? What? Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. That is absolutely. I, I mean, and once I had met you, it was in um, you know, Ayana Evans, right? And yes, at um, Alia Elba's book launch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was actually some of the imagery that you didn't get to see. I, you know, because I just didn't want to gobble up, gobble up the time. And but the Chuleta series, I, I came out. <laughs> Oh, you saw that. You, oh. <laughs> I knew you looked familiar. I couldn't place you. So I'm glad that you I'm glad that you figured that out. Um yeah, so uh I, we have a mutual friend, Elia Alba, who has this incredible book called The Supper Club. And it's funny that we're talking about this. It's it's actually super appropriate because she wanted to photograph, you know, artists that she felt needed more, you know, more shine, more, more people knowing about their work, but not just photographing them. She was thinking very much like, because she comes from a photography, um, a fashion photography background, to photograph these people and like create these monikers for them and then photograph them, you know, like because I do performance, I was a thespian and, you know, stuff like that. But it wasn't just about um, photographing these people. She hosts these dinners. She she cooks these meals, and everybody kind. She um, she hand picks these groups of people to sit and talk and have like really um, intense conversations about race issues, gender issues, X, Y, Z. Really, really powerful stuff. Um, and um, and so Chuleta, this super ratchet <laughs> hood rat chick that I've kind of create became or you know I developed over the years, was at the very first three kind of as this kind of kind of a conversation instigator. Like I, I would ask things like, so who's your audience though? But like for real though, like who's your audience? Who you making work for? Come on, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And you're talking about people going, what do you mean? You don't ask us that kind of question. Do any of you ask great artists that kind of question? And it's, you know, just dropping bombs in the water to see what happened. Um, and so it seemed appropriate for Chuleta to uh, come back. I actually retired this character because I, I kind of ran out of, you know, I was kind of like done with, you know, becoming this stereotype and the, in the alter ego in that sense. I felt like I said everything I had to say and like the work had moved on and and that this hood rap persona had kind of um, was turning into a bigger caricature than what I wanted. And so I felt like I just, it was necessary to just kind of pull her back and start doing these other these other uh, characters um, that in the reinas that you saw. But when Elia decided that she was going to drop this book, she taps me on the shoulder. She's like, you think Chuleta should, you know, be there for the launch? I'm like, you know what? Not only would she be there for the launch, but we're going to completely upgrade Chuleta. So Chuleta is married now. And all the work that I do is autobiographical, right? She's married now. She married a white dude, right? That's it, right? So now people are like, what? So now she's got this like this white ombre wig and kind of rocking the doobie. And I was very intentional to have her show up in this like uh, um, uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez inspired 
outfit with the white jacket with the slit things that she wore. You know, like when she showed up that first time at the you know the State of the Union address. So I rocked this outfit <laughs> and I had these uh, door knocker earrings that said tenured. I had them custom made. <laughs> so I, like, <laughs> and I walked into like I walked in bo like boomboxing Boasty, right? That 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 reggae song that uh, Sean Paul and uh, Stefan Don dropped, like crazy song. Um, I'm getting the, the main guy, the main producer wrong. I anyway, y'all know. So it was a hot mess, but it was how I, <laughs> but that's kind of how I roll. So <laughs> You know what, oh, yeah. that, uh, what strikes me about what you're saying and what everybody is saying is exactly what you just described, that there's room for that kind of thing in all your work. Each one of you has this amazingly kind of free form. You take this identity and that identity. You're working in this medium and that medium. They're, and then you, of course, are raising money for all of it, which is the most astonishing thing of all. Right. But the kind of free, open-endedness when the overall pitch is real activism. That's what's so striking. It's like you're having a whole lot of fun while you're doing all this amazing work. I don't like to call what I do activism though. That's my, I just, I don't, I recoil from that title. It's not, it's just not for me. I think it's because of my family and what happened and stuff mm -hmm. to my day. So I don't call myself an activist, but someone once said to me a few uh, months ago that I do root work. I'm like, I like that better. Okay. I like that better because um, I'm not. I'm never interested in the surface of things. I'm not a marcher. I don't. I like to work. I like to go behind the scenes. I like to dig, and I like to work there. That's what interests me. Yeah, so I like I, that you said that. I like that, I like that you said that. Because, yeah, oh, there's so. a, there's a point where like you know you say are activists and you think about going out in the streets and 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 I, first of all, my knees can't handle it anymore and. <laughs> You know, and, and the other thing is that, you know, I have a little one. I need to make sure that I don't get arrested. I don't get locked up, beat up or something else. Right. Um, and so I figured, let me do this, this work of radical empathy. And I do this. And I, it, I, I, I've always been a boots on the ground kind of person. And if like, for example, the Pieta piece, if, if holding people, just holding space for a little while, that if that's, if that's all that we can do to each other, like if, if that's what I can do, then, then, then let's go on ahead and do that. But to, and I, you know, activism is that language that I've had to write, you know, for funding, <laughs> right? But it's much deeper. It's like, it's much more intimate. It's very granular the way I'm working. And so I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I, I felt kind of dirty admitting that, Zina. Well, I think it's, I think it's also interesting because um, I, I, as an act, as a, as a note, and not even in quotations, but as an activist, yeah. like, I feel like, um, I've done quite a bit of work in understanding sort of like that. I think that more often than not, we are building principles around activism. And I think that um, I, what I appreciate is the is the necessity of us, for, like for, for those of us who are women of color um, and specifically black women, like the necessity that we are rarely able to enter space without activism and social justice being placed on our bodies. And so I think there's an importance in us being able to define activism for ourselves. And I think that goes in multiple directions. I think that activism is much more expansive than we sometimes give it credit for, in that I think that activism can be very hard for it and, and often is really. I don't think there's really anyone who is um, trying to be an activist who is not also um, trying to do something that fills people's hearts and makes people feel happier or more whole in the world. I'm sorry, but I also share a space. So if there's any bleed over, you're going to hear it. Um, you get a bottle like a cat. <laughs> um, you know, so I think that, um, and so I think that, you know, we are also allowed to define activism within our own realm and whatever that looks like for us. And I think it's especially important as, um, as black women and as women of color and just women in general to, um, to, to, define our activism and in terms of our own space and in terms of what we uh, want it to be. Um, so I, I definitely celebrate anyone who also like says like that isn't for me, but I also think that we can expand the definitions of activism to being outside of the realm. Like, and this is also me coming from a Western perspective, so I understand that as well. That there is a different, um, the activism looks different all over the world. But I think that overall, many of us are still moving with the principles of activism. And even if we don't, even if we aren't like in the street, I don't think that's necessary. I think that each of us, um, I think back to when I was in Atlanta 
uh, with a John Lewis fellowship studying the civil rights movement. And we were speaking to some of the original uh, Atlanta student right uh, student uh, sit-ins, uh, the people who organized that movement, those act, those organizers. And they told us this, um, Rosalind Pope uh, was telling us a story about how those who practiced, um, you know, those who like were practicing the nonviolence movement when they were trying to recruit people to join, often there would be individuals who would say, listen, if someone pours a drink on me, I'm fighting back. And that being the case, uh, those those who could not participate in the movement would go and take class for the students who were participating in the movement so that they wouldn't be marked as absent and wouldn't get kicked out of school. And so I think in that way, that's why I feel like it's so important for us to expand our understanding of what activism is, because without that, we can't all be working together towards a common goal. You know, if our work is, if our work is all headed in the direction of Black liberation, women's liberation, hopefully um, we're able to meet each other where we are at in our various realms of um, the work, quote unquote. But yeah, yeah I, I, I yeah. yeah. I feel you on that. And and I would love to hear how y'all, uh, if, if, if you agree with me, like I know that for me, uh, showing up to work is a form of activism. Showing up as, you know, very much every part of me, every, every Puerto Rican boogie down Bronx, facet of my being shows up as Professor Raimundi Ortiz in that classroom. That is like my activism because students will see me and be like, you know what? And I've had this happen. You sound like my tia, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm like, that's good. That's good. I, I want you, I want you to see that someone that looks and sounds like you, sounds like your tia, your cousin, whatever, is actually at the desk, at the other side of that desk, si se puede. I did it. You know what I mean? And, and you know, again, very boots on the ground. We're going to hang out. We're going to, but you're going to learn something. You know what I mean? And I don't want you to feel like you have to trade the accent or this or that. Because trust me, some of my other colleagues, they're not trading their accents and no one's challenging that. And so I'm I'm not going to, you know, I worked on it. I can, I can clean it up if I have to. You know what I mean? But that's just not, you know what I mean? I, I think it's important for the kids to see me where I'm at. So showing up is definitely like that form of activism. I would love to hear if y'all feel similar. Similarly, I think when you have food at the center of your consciousness at all times, and it sounds like uh, that's kind of a theme here for sure. Uh, th there's just no end to the to the to the ways in which you can start making change happen. You 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 you're working on it all the time in your own home, your own life. When you shop, when you work with people, if you're organizing because of what's been happening the last, what, 10, 20, 30 years in the food revolution, there are so much ferment and and uh, action and root work happening in every possible area of the relationship between people and food. Why it's do you think this is the case? I find this is something I find very interesting. Someone said it was like because it's a mark of the end times that when there's an obsession with food, it means it's the end of a civilization. But I'd, I'd love to understand why, you know, why food? Why food? I think it's because everybody owns it. it it's not just that everybody eats, it's that everyone owns it. It, it is the first relationship we have in our lives and it lasts to our dying day is our relationship with food. Even if you don't care about it, even if you forgot the meal the second you ate it, that is a relationship with food. So it's, the, it's, it's always there. It is always an active relationship. And I think once it went public, once it became a cause and the issues started getting out there, people just jumped in. They were ready for it. I think food is something that uh, we all need, but we don't all have access to. Um, and I think that that collective need I think I think it's the, it's it's the leading up to collection. Like it's the it, the fact that like we can gather around food. We can um, to have this most basic need that we have to meet to survive. Um, and for that, and for like you know the customs and traditions and cultures around this very basic need to survive. The fact that it's like grown in so many different directions. You know, there's a culture of people who bring you your food. There's a culture of people who gather around food. There's a culture of people who make the food that ne but never taste it. There's a culture of people who make yeah. their food and taste it and feed themselves. Like there's a culture of 
a, you know, there's a culture of people who make food in someone's home, but no, don't have the right to sit at the table with those same people yeah. they serve that food too, right? I think that food in so many ways speaks to how we live. Um, food is just that, it's just that inherent way. It's like, you know, just as far as the rules and customs and cultures, I think that, you know, Laura, something you were talking about was really interesting to me about like, even just something as simple as cake mix. And the fact that, you know, thinking about like these large companies like, you know, um, Betty Crocker and like all of these companies who were using, who, who just saw, but like just the fact that the only people that they were really interviewing were women right? Which speaks to the culture of that time and what that was about. And, and really, and I would imagine that many of them are still speaking to only women now. And it, it, and I think that that is indicative, right, of how we think of women. It's indicative of how we, of how our food is used as a symbol, right? You know, if you, if I say that I had caviar this evening, all of a sudden everyone's going to go, oh, cat, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden I'm fancy. All of a sudden that says something about me, right? It's like, food is attached to our class, it's attached uh, to our class status. You know, if if someone is uh, looking for food in um, d discarded food, for example, mm -hmm. if, if, uh, if so, then suddenly that says something about their class status and not, not just about their class status, but that also that there's so many customs and cultures and traditions around that it says something about them as a person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we talk about, you know, like, oh, like me, me being, you know, uh, so many times like being, you know, a, a very, you know, very feminine, very, uh, you know, attractive woman, the expectation, you know, in a time where I was interested in men or allowed, allowed myself to be interested in men. Um, you know, it was, it was such a thing whenever I would say that I, I'm not really that great a cook. I don't really like to cook. You know, I, I tend to order like I can, but I'm just, it, I just don't, generally don't have time, you know, which, which is also status symbol of me. Right. Or it says something about me that it's like, I often don't have time to cook. And what does that say about me, about and about me as a woman? And that it also would mean when I would say, I remember I was, there was this, this man way in the past who I talked to <laughs> and who was like, oh, wow, you don't, you don't cook. Like, that's just so, you just look like you're such an independent woman. Like you just have your stuff together. And I was like, well, I wear a cape when I order from Seamless. Does that count? You know, and it's, I think that, and I think that in many ways it's like, uh, I think that to answer your question, Zina, I think that food is just attached to so much of how we define ourselves and how we define our relationships to other people. So I think it would be impossible for us to, you know, as we say, we are, I think, yes, we are at the end of times. And so we are looking for self-definition. We are looking for communal definition. And yeah. uh, food is kind of the simplest and most, you know, inherently basic level that we can get to, to kind of say, okay, you know, yeah. I think, I, I also think of like, you know, you know, I think of like, you know, uh, Tia's and you know grandmamas and Medea's who like would go who in the hood you know when would go to uh, like the construction sites and bring like pies and bring like you know meals that they would bring every single day and that was part of their income right that's how they brought food to that's how they brought like that's how they would they would make food that they would make for other people and then that income would help them put food on their own table and so I think that there's just such it's such an interesting and complicated system that we have around this this thing we call food. Yeah, I you, you know, what you were saying, Ian, I just um just reminded me of a bunch of different things, like and my connections to food, being able to provide food for myself, provide food for my family, coming from a pretty traditional Puerto Rican, how like a two rosary a day, you know, Catholic mama, right? From from La Isla. Um, the thought of of eating food out when I made food, you know what I mean? It's like that's not, you don't do that. And I catch myself even now thinking like, well, we have food at home. We're going to make that food. And I, I think about the stories of my mother telling me like, the, you know, calling, calling a chicken maybe once a week. That was, that was, you know, that was, you know, today we eat meat. So let's ever gather around and, and sit down and eat and, and taking those stories with me as a, you know, when I was like, when I was a young bride, not knowing how to cook and then trying to, you know, like feeling my, my worth as a, as a woman, um, kind of diminished to my my then partner um because I couldn't cook and I was trying to make Puerto Rican rice and then I'd screw it up and I'd run to the you know to the Chinese restaurant down the street and try to come home and like <laughs> try to hide the boxes before trying to present my dinner. You know, and like ha like hanging that kind of self-worth of being able to provide meals. Um uh I was broke for a real long time. And so uh the kind of food that I was able to provide also like was that status, not, not even that I was high class, that I had anything at all, you know? Um, and that kind of, that urban grit, that urban, um, the urban intellect 
of, okay, well, this is how much money I have. All I can get, I know that if I go to that Korean shop, I could get actually half a carton of eggs for a dollar and they could spend, they serve, they, they provide rice and like everything was like part, like uh, portioned out by dollar, like the weight, but by dollar. So that if you went in with $5, you can get half a dozen eggs, a handful of rice, you know, some beans or whatever. And so you could feed yourself for a couple of days on a very small budget. And I think that spoke that spoke a lot to where I was living and how I was living. And and so to now, well, you have food in the in the you have food all over the place. You've got three different types of, you know, peas and this and gandules and you know, artisanal, whatever the hell. <laughs> cause I, cause now even now, like I think because I'm in this, I'm in a different place and I recognize the privilege of being in this place. Um, I go grocery shopping the way people might go shoe shopping or dress shopping, you know what I mean, or handbag shopping. I'm just like, I'm going to see what's up in the supermarket this week and what what's looking luxurious. What? Is that Argentinian shrimp is on sale? Stop. You know what I mean? Like, and and that's that's that thing that for me, I feel like I made it because I can I can provide for my family and, and we don't go without anymore. But and that's also very much attached to my mother saying, you know, we didn't have, we didn't always have food. And I remember, not that, she, not that in my home, we certainly had hard times, but food was always on the table. We didn't have cable, we didn't have this or that, but food was, that was one of those things that you know, we have this. And so that has become my parenting style. That's my, that's how I roll. Like, and I also, I'm not trying to eat the garbage that's out in the, in the campus. You know what I mean? So I will bring my my rice. I'm gonna bring my salad. I'm, you know, I could eat like, you know, Asian chow, but why would I want to eat that? I'm not gonna eat that. I got some home cooking. You know what I mean? Like, does your hands are on it? You know, my like my mother would say, you don't know who touched that. <laughs> and there's that 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 thing of like just this health health consciousness, but also like health consciousness. Like this was love. This is. This was made with love. This was made with caring. I took, you know, I'm taking care of myself. I'm taking care of my family. I'm trying to trying to be conscious in all those other types of ways. And that's a different kind of health. So anyway, I'm not going to keep talking. <laughs> but Zena's question is really an interesting one. Why now? And I wonder if it's because um, for ever, really, uh, talk about food was kept at home. You didn't do it in public. You didn't. You didn't, uh, it, it wasn't, at least in, in this country, in the United States, it wasn't the kind of thing that you talked about because it was women's work and it was domestic and it was housework and it had no dignity. You, you, if you talked about food, you did it at home. Then there was a breakthrough and food came out in the open and academics and scholars and people writing books and then everybody stirring up the whole field of uh, the need for food and and uh, you know food justice and the food revolution all that it just i think it was just pent up emotion i think that's why we're seeing it now because we clamped down on it for all these centuries mm. yeah so it's it's sort of concomitant with um psychology and you know i think just people becoming more educated in a sense and also being freer or feeling freer personally and then having the time to start to look at other aspects of the self and your life and yeah and then you a light on food i always think of it as the only sort of activism that interests me really it's this thing of you know i don't really i try not i mean i've been posting politically recently but i try not I, before that i was not really into that either just just memes just funny things that maybe laugh. but um every time there was a someone who does an allotment or someone who's working with food, that's that's I was right there. I'm like, uh-huh, that's exactly what we need. In a way, that's more important than anything else. And just get yourself, get yourself your land, go, you know, grow some food, and then call it a day. For me, that's kind of the most important thing. And certainly in Nigeria, you know, it's a way of, instead of, like, being against oil, I just thought I'd rather be pro-agriculture and pro-agribusiness and give life to that and do it. I do it that way, you know? So I, I just find that easier, actually, as a human being. And I don't railing against is like not generative for me. I don't draw energy from it, not that way. I'm just, that's, just not, that's just my personality, I suppose. So for me, feeding into that and, you know, I'm now thinking of different lines of, you know, products and things that I'm doing and, but food, but I think art is also very, for me, a very important medium because it's just a, a system. It's just a, a kind of mechanism 
but I, you know, taking in information, metabolizing information, and then, you know, from, you know, sharing the information. And I think art is the freest way for me to be able to decide what to do and figure out how to make my next move as an ultimate freedom in it. So, um, so even then I don't even feel like, yes, I'm an artist, but even now I'm also thinking about, ah, I don't know, ah, whatever. I just do things now, as far as I'm concerned. I just do things, you know, art and all these things, are, they're, they're, they're mechanisms and they are a life unto themselves. They have their own spiritual. And uh, you know, they you know, portraiture and they're like, ooh, and I'm gonna go over to here. Ooh, and now I'm gonna explore over here. It's doing its own exploration as well. So I think art is exploring. And I think, I hope, I hope we see art in politics. That's a really interesting thing I'm thinking about. You know, what does it mean to put art in politics? In a real way, not in just the performative way, not just like, oh, I'm gonna help you figure out some banners. I'm like, mm -mm, no. How, let's get, let's, when, when we ingest it, and metabolize it and break it down. And then how does it show up then? That's that's what interests me more than the usual kind of in your face. This is, you know, I'm just, mm -mm, no. It's all about, and also it's really interesting what you're saying, Wanda, about, you know, this COVID time and planting. I'm the same as you, I started um, planting and um, <laughs> and Basil hates me. I don't understand what Basil has against me, but Basil- <laughs> you love is like you. She is freaky. You know, yeah, I hate Basil. Basil. Sorry, I don't like Basil. And they say it's supposed to be nice around plants. And I try, but I'm just like having <laughs> arguments with my Basil. Anyway, so, but the thing <laughs> is, it's, in, it's invaded my language and the way I think about my work. I think it's actually really helped my work completely. Thinking about, I always talk about soil and which soils, are, like which place is a good soil for me. Like New York ceased to be a good soil for me. And I feel like, oh, California happens to be a better soil for me. I don't know for how long, but certainly for now, it's like a really good soil. And it's just invaded the, my language. It's invaded the way I think about my work. It's sort of changed my work as well. And, and that's, yeah. So it's, it's when you expose yourself and open and submit to nature and food and all these things, then things change in ways that you can't even, you don't even know. And I love to, I, I love it when I don't know what's going to happen or what's going to come out of it. And that's, that's such a, a beautiful part of all of this. So I think, yeah, working with food is generative and magical. And it's doing things that we don't understand, like sitting down and sharing a meal with people, like what you would do, sitting down, what is it that's happening? You know, there's a greater alchemy at work, isn't there? When you're sitting down and sharing a meal, it's not just there's something else that's going on. We can't even, I can't even describe it. And I've been focused on this for like six years. Like what is going on? Like if you want to share an idea, you know, invite people to dinner. So, okay, so what's happening when you're, What's happening in the belly and you're hearing something and at the same time something's going on in the belly, what is that? You know? Yeah. It's not just conviviality, there's a chemical reaction. Something is going on here. So, you know, I just think that it's beginning to open up to us. I think we're just at the very, just the, tip, the tip, tip, tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding what this power is and what this alchemy is. And actually a lot of my, my next film is also about that. It's about like the power of fruit. I'm obsessed with fruit, but that's a conversation thing at the time. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that, right? So um, thinking about planting, and I, I kind of touched upon it briefly in, in the interest of time, but gardening and planting kicked my ass in such a way. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I got to this place because I was invited, which, oh my God, Zena, Zena, you should apply to this residency. Um, so it was in Kingsbury, Texas. Um, uh, a husband and wife, old, old friends of mine, um, uh, Allison and Shane Hanemeyer, uh, started this residency in Kingsbury, Texas called Habitable Spaces. And so essentially they've got this like this homegrown, sustainable permaculture forest and they've got animals, chickens, this, that, geese, guinea hen. Don't get me started on the guinea fowl. That was... <laughs> I may or may not That's have. So kicked. beautiful. That's so beautiful. I may, I may have not kicked so one. Risky. I don't know. I'm not feeling guinea fowl, but I just know they're, they're more beautiful, beautiful alive. They're way more beautiful alive. Just like they're it's beautiful, fun. but the two two of them they bit the bullet because they were very aggressive. Um, but anyway, that's a whole other conversation. I I I I plucked my first bird. <laughs> Have a guinea fowl have symposium and then we'll do basil symposium later. <laughs> I'll wear my feathers, my, my, my trophy feathers from the culling of those birds. Um, but in that place, so now and, and let me paint a, let me paint a picture for y'all. Understand, understand how how Bronx I am. 
That's what I'm going to say. I'm just that Bronx. I'm six train. You know what I mean? I am, I'm just Bronx. And so I'm, you know, I go to this residency in the armpit ass crack and the corner, I mean, it's somewhere between Austin and, oh shit, where's the other big one? San Antonio. But there's like nothing around. And so they get this, you know, this husband and wife, they got this space and they really built it up from the ground up. I don't know how they did it, just incredible imagination. And so they invite these artists to come up and spend some time, hang out on the farm, make work that they can leave with the community somehow. And then, you know, you participate in this farm. First thing, could not find good boots to be in a farm. So I show up with these like, kind of like a stacked heel thing. And I don't know where I'm going. And so like, that's the first mistake. I show up with these boots and everybody's like, where do you think you're going? <laughs> so, so in so in all of that, after a month, I learned how to how to feed a, aggressive geese using using the top, the lid of a garbage can as a shield to not get pecked in the in the nethers, right? While feeding the geese and ducks. And you know, I was became comfortable with goat shit on my sneakers and like ceremonially threw the sneakers out by the end of my time. All of these things, one of, I'm I'm in the soil, I'm pulling weeds, I'm, you know, checking out for checking for chicken eggs every morning. Um, you know, um we're using like a you know sustainable toilet, aka latrine. Um understand I said I was Bronx, right? All day. So this is incredibly different for me. And all of all of this, I'm there just as the world is starting to catch fire. We're talking about Bernie Sanders. We're talking about sustainability. We're talking about food justice and how you know, and all of this. And this is this is this is exactly where I'm at in this place. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I I completely understand. Get, I get off the farm, go back home. People are fighting over toilet paper. Can't find eggs for my baby. And I'm just like, all of a sudden, I don't know if you ever seen the movie The Ten Commandments with oh, yeah. Charlton Heston. You know how when he comes down from the mountain and he's got this crazy white streak in his hair and he's like got this crazy look in his eye, like knowledge of the great beyond. <laughs> and I come back. Oh, oh, my eyes have been opened. And conversations about how you know the the food industry here is what has kept us. That's why we have to have two two people working in the house because you have to you have to go to the store to buy your food and how is it they clear out like acres of land instead of having farm farms there for people to grow stuff they'll clear out acres of land to throw a whole food so you can have your organic food wait a minute ah none of that makes sense and yet so we're all slaves and we're chained and this and that so i came back like i live i have i have like soil and I'm going to plant and I'm going to feed my family and I'm, I'm my chains are broken and my mind is free. <laughs> it's <a> season <laughs> in Florida where you don't plant and it's the season that I started planting. It's like, it's just like, just where the rains are starting. I planted zucchini. I planted this. I planted rows of corn. That's really, really ambitious. Though. I mean, I haven't even started any any vegetables at all. I it's will, just I, we broke ground. We I made like two a ten. My husband and I made like two ten foot by ten foot patches. I planted corn. I planted sweet peas. I planted all this shit. I was out there every morning. I went. I ordered clothes from Duluth Trading Company. I ordered farmer pants and boots. The boots I should have had. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had in Texas. And I have my little hat and my sunscreen and my organic. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you too much about caterpillar shit now. And because they destroyed my beautiful corn. It was coming up beautifully, started tasseling. And then so I in order to get to the caterpillars, and you had to kind of unwind the spiral. But if you unwind the spiral too much, you break the thing. So so here I am. I'm I'm on my, I'm studying, I'm learning YouTube down on how to organic, blah, blah, blah. My corn grew so distorted and so warped. And my zucchini, I planted them too close together. So they caught like powdery mildew. And then I thought I picked one up that I saw, I would see a beautiful one, pick it up and it would just melt in my hands because it was rotted from the inside. And they were bugs that were eating the vine borers. I know way too much about critters now, but it was all of, I mean, this, and I think I got out of three rows 
about 10 or 12 things deep of corn. I only got three edible pieces of corn. They're beautiful, but they were like this little. Some of them were all warped and crazy looking. And I took the lesson, right? I was, my, I, my ego was seriously bruised. But I also realized that this is what happens when you try to walk into a room like you know what you're doing and try to dominate. And I felt like that's a very American thing. That's a very, you know, just like, I got this. I came, I was four weeks up in the mountain, up in the woods with, with goats. I got this. And, and then, um, but it was humbling, but it became this metaphor for what we're looking at in our society. Like you are watching people that are used to oppressing and you are watching people that are tired of being oppressed and you've got this pressure cooker. And this is what happens when you got two forces that are just tired of each other's shit start to burst the seams and it would start to change my sculptures. I started making these things that started off as wigs or wig stands, but then I started using spray foam and like watching these things. Those burn. are really, really good. I did a screenshot of it. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, now, now you're, you're hitting on something really like, thank you. Sense. I really like that sculpture. And so now, thank you very much. And so now I'm in Pennsylvania, not anywhere near my studio. I'm helping. I'm out here with my family, helping out, um, uh, my in-laws have both have hip injuries, so we're here until everybody's cool. But I couldn't, I can't stop thinking about these bulges, these things, like how things, like how things are bursting at the seams. So I get here around Halloween. So what do I do? I'm up in Pennsylvania, go take my kid on a hayride, um, and then we get to pick a pumpkin. And I found one of those pumpkins that have all those bumps on them that look like they've got sebaceous cysts. I don't know what strain that is. Laura, you could help me out at some point. <laughs> I feel absolutely in love with it. And so I've been drawing the nodules that are on the pumpkins. Mm. I don't know if you can see. It's yeah. kind of strange glare. But I am obsessed with these weird bumps on these pumpkins. I can't get enough of them. And my son's like, we got to shave that thing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't you touch my pumpkin. There you go. So again, they look like they're bursting and they're weird and they're kind of decaying. And now it started raining and getting cold. And so I keep thinking about this again and again about the pressure cooker, um, the, you know, things kind of bursting and bubbling. And um, in one of the, I didn't get to show uh, close-ups or details of, of the sculptures, but I was experimenting with different types of foam and uh, using this sort of expanding liquid poly, um, uh, 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 polyurethane, not polyurethane. Why can't I think of my own materials? Anyway, it's got this strange viscosity to it, um, probably because I screwed up the recipe. <laughs> like you, so you mix this part of this, this part of that. You stir it for thirty seconds, and it should do this thing. That is not what happened. Just like my garden, just like my spring. <laughs> so, but what's been really nice about this entire thing is being open and surrendering to not knowing. I treat cooking like that too. I'm like, I think this is gonna work out. I'm not really sure. Um, my husband is. I think something a bit controversial about not knowing, though. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't assume anyone's politics or anything like that. So, but the idea of not knowing, you know, and I, I am not a follower of QAnon, but in a way I sort of, there's a thing of like understanding, the play, being in a place of not knowing and wanting to control the information in some way. And if we were trying to be, to come from a place of openness and um, empathy to sort of understand people that think, in that way, and I don't know if any of you are, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to talk, you know, but I'm just saying that if that's the case, this is this whole moment, and maybe gardening can help, maybe doing it for yourself would help in terms of trying to figure out, you know, because um, it does come from a, I think, a, a perfectly legitimate fear about, well, you know, what is going on in our food and what is, you yeah. know, what is going on, and you're educated to a certain level, and but it doesn't go beyond a certain level. You know, scientists do know more than you and they always will. Unless <laughs> yeah. you know. It's an act of faith, sadly. Even I, I consider believing in science and I do still an act of faith because I am not a physicist. I yes, study you know, well, you I have just kind of have to, I just think, you know what, I'm going to believe you. It's an act of faith, sadly. So it's how different is it in, a, in some ways? Anyway, I'm just saying that I feel like all these things, this relationship with not knowing and the idea of unlearning, you know, I do think that this moment and planting and all these ideas to do with food, it's kind of helping us understand these things. It's not just about, it's not just about the food, it's about our relationship.
scientific knowledge and everything you've been describing, Wanda, is like what food does to you. This is what food studies are doing. And this is yeah. what I love because food is an entity. I mean, I always break it down to actual fruit and vegetables anyway, but let's just think of it as a quality. Let's think of it as food as an organism. They're, you know, they're just, they're just getting started. And I, no, I'm not gonna, you're gonna think I'm crazy. I'm gonna leave that for my art videos and put my crazy <laughs> ideas in there. But I'm just saying, that, <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, food is doing all these things. And I think gardeners know this, have known this for time. I just love all the, I've started following all these hot farmers. Um, I think they're all gay, but they're all like super hot. I'm straight, like, so like, hot, like, like hot. Hot. sexually good looking, yeah, farmers. Mm, on Instagram, there's one, the mustachioed one. He's like gorgeous. I think he's from Germany or some shit. Anyway, and um, but it's really interesting. Links in the chat. Links in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just like I'm starting to sort of follow all these because the, their knowledge. They don't share their knowledge. I don't know what it is about people that work with food and these things. They don't like to share. It's a bit kind of. It's a bit. It works with you in. It's very internal. It's very very interesting. What food? I like, dropped that link. <laughs> um, maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But I just think that you know, I'm sort of following all these people now because I'm just sort of like interested in seeing how working with the land works on them. So I am interested in more expressive kind of people, which is why I'm interested in the idea of the artist farmer. I was googling that. So like, okay, what is it to be an artist farmer? You know, so, what, 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 that, what does that look like? What does that do? And if I was starting to, farm, would I do, like, we, I would probably do some very weird things. Like, that's something I would do. Because the thing about artists is they give themselves permission to do things, you see. I think everyone th might think the same way as an artist, but they don't give themselves permission to do it. An artist is like the difference between thinking it and doing it. So I might actually do the weird thing that I think about. So maybe that's the way art, art and farming might interrelate. I don't know. All I'm saying is that food is like, we, we, we think we're studying food, food is studying us. Well, and there's two things I wanted to say. Like, um, when you talk about the hot farmers, it was, so I was had to- I just like blasted <laughs> out all this crazy ideas and information. And she's Sorry. like, hot farmer. I heard you. And um, I when I got back, what's the name of that guy? He's, oh my God, he's on TED Talks. He's famous in doing, like doing urban farming in, in Los Angeles. Um, oh, was he oh. standing on the meat in the medians and like right, like in, right in the hood? Ronald yeah, yeah, I know him. I called him on a masterclass. Yeah, I was like the gangster gardener. Yeah, I'm like, how you do it? <laughs> but I was like, I see. Okay, no, and you, you follow him on masterclass. He doesn't. He can help you grow your corn. I, yeah, he'll be like, he'll be like, bitch, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> he's and I'll be like, all right, I understand. I'm not gonna take offense. That's 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 quite accurate. But <laughs> and the other thing though is that ancestral knowledge. Like my mom grew up in La Finca. Like she grew up calling her chickens and doing this and like, you know what I mean? And she like, she also didn't share any of this with me because how could she teach us if she's living in an apartment in the Bronx? Right, you know, but that's that's like what I love about this conversation is like sometimes the not sharing from generation to generation is a form of assimilation too. Like, oh, yeah. and and so it's it's a it's a you know, but then it's also it's like convenience, assimilation, time. You know, it's 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 definitely all of that, and then also like expert culture. That the idea that Western society has I, there's this feeling of like you must be an expert. And so I feel like we're in this moment that everybody is humbled, like, mm -hmm. and they're in the same place. Like, every mm -hmm. you're 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 going to have to. You're not out the way that you used to be, and you're wrestling with the things that are very at the the base level: food, shelter, water, yeah, yeah, yeah. community, and and your ideas. Like, but I've mastered this. I've done that. I should be able to do this. And it's like very humbling. Nature's like, mm, you've been away from me, boo. Like, yeah, like maybe you oh, don't know me one. that well. Yeah, that's you don't. You, don't cool. you know <laughs> where you been? You know, so um, but you don't know Jack. <laughs> yeah, like give, give me a few months. You know, um, I wanted to ask you a one question that I, I I wanted to to see what has been the most restorative part of your work. Like what? Like what? Like where have you been restored um, in your work, and and also even in the pivot of 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 right now um i think uh th that humility has brought me back to the place of discovery right um and willingness to take 
to go back to center and say, okay, I don't know this and let's proceed the same way. I, I started throwing things on the ground. And the other thing was about a, a humility and bravery, right? And I think that idea of the expert, like, well, I, you know, I'm a master of this and I teach in the university and people look up to me and this is what it's expected of me. And then I, you know, I go to the, I go to the residency, I come back all crazy. And, but what was restored, <laughs> what was restored was the sense of discovery of, exper of experimentation, the kind of like the wild came out, you know, like the wild, because like, everything was kind of very restrained in my work. And then it's like, you know what? Why does this have to be this way? This could be sloppy and dirty. None of this is pretty. None of what's happening is pretty. And trying to like contain it is just stupid. And so that was restorative for me to come back to this place. Like, I don't really know what's going to happen. I'm going to throw these rhinestones right here. And I'm, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen to these extensions, but I'm hitting with this thing, this thing right quick. And, and I was going crazy. And I've got stuff stuck to me. But it felt good to be in this place of like, you know, everything is so insane no one knows anymore. And so it was humbling to not be the one with the answers or to have to present as if I had the answers, even if I didn't, you know? Um, so, and, and then also coming to a place where like, you know, I don't have it right now to perform and I'm not going to, you know what I mean? Like that was something else was like, y'all, everybody, all y'all are bugging out. And I didn't think that, you know, that I had the courage to say that out loud, but like, you know what, we're in a time that if someone doesn't want to see me sitting and holding people and being careful and being caring and empathetic and i just would walk up to me and shoot me because i don't like that i'm you know that i'm that i'm in my blackness as an afro latina that i'm with and that i'm with mi gente they could turn around and uh, no 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 you know what right now at the time i will do my work in other ways you know so that was that was something that was very restorative to me to be like you know what i really can't right now i need to be with my family i need to make my work i need to just kind of insulate lay low and so that was for me very restorative i love it mm -hmm. anyone else i would love to hear you all as well what was the question um i wanted to know what's the most restorative part of your work like what have you found what have you been restored by in in doing the work even in this time of uh this pivot this great pause yeah i mean i think definitely for me it's just deciding to, that it's okay to focus on food and all my talk about, you know, um, food having its own spirit or it's being its own being, that sort of like, that's really emerged. There's always the seeds of it, but so much everything, ever since everything kind of went tamped down, you know, a lot of other things have started to go, okay, you start to hear other things, you start to attend to other ideas. And actually it's been incredibly, it's like been like fertilizer for my practice. Mm -hmm. And I've never been so busy in the last six months. I've just done so many things. And, um, and I do have like a, a really big project that um, I didn't really recognize or understand what it was. Like I said, I've been working with gin since like 2014 and, you know, obviously known about it since my childhood, but it's now turning into this like very, 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 very expensive project, like huge actually. And, um, and it's just me allowing it to be its thing. I'm just allowing things, I'm getting out of my own way and allowing certain things to come through. But also I like my Instagram for as well, as well, it's like it's mostly food now. I'm just like, it's food and some art and memes in the stories, but I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I think I just want to go towards joy immediately, towards joy and communion immediately. I just don't want to be faffing around. And I just, it's just the directness is the thing that is important to me now. Just. You know, I don't want to be the artist that gets in the way of everything. I'm just like laughing around. So I can't, I don't know if I can be bothered with art right now. It's just like, really? You know, why don't you just do the thing instead of, you know, perform the thing, just like do the thing. So I'm in that space right now. But I think food in itself is telling me that. Food is just like, do the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the energy that I've got. And it's really that simple, do the thing. Mm -hmm. Laura, are you in? Well, for me, you know, I'm a writer, and so my daily uh, work life isn't that different with a pandemic raging outside, but I'm still right. sitting here looking at looking at what I do. So, um, so you're focusing on that all the time. But oddly, the isolation and the the kind of the the fact that so much of my other life is just stilled all around. 
there's a kind of freedom in that. I, I find I'm reading uh, in a little bit of a different spirit that there's more room in my study for me, for my own thoughts to be flying around. All these sort of critics and people who came before, and the people who did the same thing only better, and they're always sitting on my shoulder. But you know, there's a pandemic, so they all sort of went away. They too are off in isolation somewhere, and it's just me. So there's a nice little bit of freedom there that I don't always have. Um, I think I've, since a very early age, uh, grown up with a strong sense of what I felt was right and what I felt was wrong. And one of the greatest frustrations of my life is that there were um, these large injustices that occurred in the world that I knew I didn't have any, I wasn't the person to change. I could talk about what I felt should happen, and but I couldn't actually do anything about it. And um, I think that the greatest pleasure that I get out of the work that I do with the Oprah Project um, is that, you know, I'm at my heart, I am a storyteller, like my training is as an actress. And so, you know, I, I'm very much dedicated to stories. And I think that for a long time, we've told the story of black trans people as if we are undeserving of life, resources, um, and access to food. Um, and I am the joy that the Oprah Project brings me is that I get to be a part of a different story um, that changes, um, you know. And I'm and I'm one of many people who are doing this in, this work. But um, I'm just very grateful to get to tell a different story, and um, hopefully a story. Well, that I lasts. definitely appreciate that all of you all are uh, doing work and telling stories and creating and writing um, in ways that will definitely last. Um, and definitely connect the dots. I feel like this is one of those conversations that when you look back on it, it's it's going to, it's connecting so many things that before COVID seemed so like kind of far away from each other, but in this conversation, they all came together. And I hope that you all, if you would love to, I would love if you would submit, even if it's just a simple tea recipe, um, either a food memory or um, a recipe to the website where we're doing reclamation. Um, and I just wanna say on behalf of the National Museum and the Women of Women in the Arts that your work is extremely important. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be in a space where it is understood that what you do is a fine art and it gets to be respected that way um, and have platforms where we can have these discussion that brings it all together this way. Um, so. This has been great. I've wanted you all to, I wish we had, and, and I hope that we could do this. I, I would love to just bring, um, when we're together in person, we have a dinner afterwards and all the questions and conversation happens over dinner. And it's this, it's, it's a very fascinating dynamic um, when you have like uh, speakers and like 200 people sitting down having dinner together and having these conversations with this mic pass. And so I'm glad that we could still have this kind of intimacy now um, cause in a way it kind of feels like just a fly on the wall and just like, you kind of even forget, um, when you're having the conversation in front of people this way. So thank you all. Thank you sincerely. And, um, everyone please stay tuned. Uh, cause we have more coming up. We have the curative collective tomorrow. Um, and we'll be looking at, um, mutual aid apothecary. They are a group of women that two women that just got together and said, our community needs homemade tinctures and teas and steams. And we're gonna, we're gonna go to these farms and get this, um, get the, get the, the ingredients and make them. Um, I'm part of the medicine making as well. So we just, they just get it and put it out to the community for free. And then we also have this conversation called the tea, which is women musicians um, playing music from their kitchen over a cup of tea. So, that happens every first Friday, but we have one on the 20th. So, but thank you all so much. I hope that you all stay in contact and um, we will find a way to do this again and reconnect. Thank you. Yes, yes. I thank you so much for inviting us. I want to play with y'all. Let's, let's do a thing. <laughs> right. Something.